We come to the end of our study in the book of Hebrews. Does anybody remember when we started this? I don't. <laughs> it's been a long time ago. Um, but uh, this is the end. You know, sometimes when we're reading our Bibles, we get towards the end of a book. And there's just a few verses left. It's like, okay, I've got the goodie out of this book. All the good information I've already read. I'm just kind of listing those last verses and just quick, quick end it without giving them a whole lot of thought. And that, that's probably not good on our part. In fact, I'm sure it's not. We, we know that all Scripture, as we already read this morning in our opening verse, <clears throat> all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable. So these last few verses are important. <clears throat> this whole last chapter, in many respects, has been kind of like closing comments. Just like kind of a rapid fire getting through a few key points before he closes the book. And especially when you get to verse 18, which is where this message actually began. We started this two weeks ago. Had a little interlude there with Mother's Day. Now we're back to it. But we covered verses 18 through 21, I believe. And um, it's, it's even more, you might say, closing comments. I've got this uh, title, Last But Not Least. It's the last words he has to say in this letter, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. And let me just review a little bit of what we've looked at thus far. Certainly in these verses, verses 18 and 19, we see prayer requested. And the, the writer um, wanted to accomplish a few things, I think, through this request of prayer. He certainly desired fellowship in prayer. It's always encouraging to know Especially, especially when you can't be with someone, that you're still fellowshipping with them in prayer. You're, you're concerned about the same things. You're praying to God about the same things. And you know they're praying for you and perhaps vice versa. And that's encouraging. There's that fellowship in prayer. But one of the main concerns of the writer is that he actually wanted to be with them in person. He wanted to fellowship in person. And that's what he wanted them to pray about. Was that the day would come soon when they would be able to see each other face to face. And I'm sure that he would have actually rather have given them the information he gave them in this letter face to face. And we're going we're to see that more vividly here in a few moments. That that seems to really would have been the preferred motive of communication. But a letter is good when you can't see one face to face. So he requested this prayer. But then he also offered prayer in verses 20 and 21. And I find it really fascinating. It's amazing how much theology you can get in a prayer. <laughs> you, you can be praying and you can be rehearsing, be rehearsing theological truths, truths about God. And I, and I find that the writer of Hebrews, in this prayer, kind of just briefly hit on some of the key doctrinal, theological points that he talked about throughout the letter. And so the first part of it is, is quite doxological. It's praise. It's worship. Directed at God himself, acknowledging God. And then also in verse 21, we see him interceding as well for them. He, he, he prayed for their spiritual well-being. He wanted them to be complete and mature in every good work to do his will. He wanted God to work in them what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. And of course, he gives all the glory to Christ, knowing that it's it's... We don't credit, take credit for anything. The work, the good things that are accomplished in us are God's doing to the Lord Jesus Christ and to Him be the glory. So that brings us then up to where we're at here today, where we have the closing comments of the closing comments. <laughs> okay, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll look at what these last few verses have to say. Father, thank you for the privilege of being here. We've enjoyed this study in the book of Hebrews. It's been very applicable to us as well in a different way. Perhaps as our circumstances are different, the things that we're experiencing are different than that of the Hebrew people that this writer wrote to. But as your word says, all scripture is given for is, is, is given by inspiration of God. It's your word. That makes it vitally important. It makes it authoritative. It makes it sufficient. And it is sufficient for doctrine, for truth, for correction, for instruction, for righteousness, that we may be complete, that we may be mature, equipped for every good work. It's, it's very sufficient. And that's true of this book for us. And we're grateful for having had the opportunity to study it. And as we wrap it up here today, help us to glean just a few 
vital truths that are still here in these last few verses. Or before we actually look into the Word, I, I, I do want to lift up Tim today. We'll just give him a special, special dying grace. Um, Lord, he's, he's, he knows you. He, he knows that he will be with you when he passes from this life. But this is happening earlier than he would have anticipated. It's from our vantage point earlier than what seems just to us. But Lord, you're just God. You have a, a reason and purpose. And it's, it's within your sovereign will to allow Tim to pass from this life to the next. We just need a lot of grace to deal with that and, and, and he more than anyone. And so I pray that your grace would be sufficient for him at this time. You would comfort him. Come from the family, even today as there's a wedding that, that will be perhaps tempered a little bit um, because of circumstances with him, but I just pray it will still be a joyous occasion, joyous occasion and a blessing to everyone that's able to take part of it. I also just want to lift up Mrs. Bear, Caleb's mother, and she also is about to pass into eternity. Lord, that's not a bad thing. We're so grateful that these folks know you. They have a relationship with you through the Lord Jesus Christ. They are trusting in the work that Jesus did on the cross on their behalf to save them from the penalty of their sins. And they're, they're on their way to heaven. And that's a delightful thing. It's, it's, it's just not pleasant for those of us left behind. And I pray for the bear of the Keck family that you'll just give them peace as they say, say goodbye to mother, grandmother, soul. So we're now again, just speak to our hearts as we as we look into these remaining verses in Hebrews. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I went through that review there without changing the pages in my notes here, so let me get that up to speed here. All right. Um, okay, so as I said, the entire passage has really been about closing comments, but these are the closing comments and the closing comments. And we'll find here in verse 22, as well as verse 24, um, some things that, that the writer wanted them to do. There's some things he wanted these people to do. Look here at verse 22. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written to you in a few words. Now this is kind of interesting, and I don't mean to belabor this, but as you look at that verse... It's, okay, so he wants them. He's, he, he appeals to them. He's, he's, he's pleading with them. Bear with the word of exhortation. And we just took that phrase, and I, and I think we should just take that phrase to mean what it appears to mean, that he wants them to bear, to, to endure, to, to, to pay close attention to, to, to the words that he's written to them, this whole letter. But it's interesting that he seems to tie it here to the fact that his letter is short. <laughs> he says, for I have written to you in few words. What does he mean by that? Bear with this word of exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Well, again, don't, don't want to belabor something that's not necessarily all that significant. I think, again, I do think the primary message is here, here is, listen to the words I've written to you. But I think that what's, what has happened here, if, as we think back on the book of Hebrews and the, and the kind of topics, the range of topics and the things he's had to address, there was a, a lot of, I would say, difficult passages. Things that weren't that easy to, to understand, perhaps. Perhaps not that easy to accept. And he had to write to them in these, in these, 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 these um, complicated subjects He'd have rather spoken to them in person. He had to do it by letter. And he had to do it relatively short. There's so much more that could have been said. He could have given so much more explanation. He could have probably made it easier, had the letter been longer, for them to understand what he was trying to communicate to them. But it's kind of a short letter to, to, to pack in so much stuff. But he doesn't want that to take away from the fact that this is important stuff. And you need to bear with it. You need to endure it. You need to take the time. To really understand what I'm communicating to you. So that's, that's his concern. In other words, he wanted them to respond to what he wrote to them entirely differently 
than what Paul warns against in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Notice what Paul says there. He's actually admonishing Timothy to preach the word. And he's, and he's admonishing him to do so in spite of the fact that there's going to be people who aren't even really going to care to listen. Listen to what he says. Preach the word. Paul writing to Timothy. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Interestingly, the words not endure, as, as Paul warns Timothy, there's going to come a time when they're not going to endure. That's the exact same word we find here in Hebrews that's translated bear with. There, there's going to come a time when people are not going to bear with. They're not going to endure. They're just not going to put up with sound doctrine. They're going to let it go in one ear and out the other because they want something to tickle their ears. They have itching ears. They want to have their itching ears satisfied. They don't care about sound doctrine. That's, that's what the writer of Hebrews doesn't want. He's saying, listen, you need to bear with this. You need to, you need to hear what I have to say. You see, the Hebrew people, as we've rehearsed time and again as we've gone through this study, were experiencing intense pressures of persecution. Believing Jews were being pressured to forsake their Christianity and go back to the traditions of Judaism. The Jews who were still steeped in their traditions and did not want to receive Jesus Christ as Savior were being pressured to stay that way. Don't, don't turn to Christ. And so they're, they're in, in, in experiencing intense pressures, intense persecutions, and, and, and real threats to their livelihood for their faith. Or for their considering the faith. And you know what? It's, it's, it's when we're under pressure. No matter who we are at what time ever. Including you and us today. It's, it's, it's challenging when we're under pressure. No matter what the source is. To reject hard truth. For a simpler, more palatable way. We have, we have a tendency to take the path of least resistance. That's human nature. And sometimes teaching is challenging to listen to and to hear and to soak in. Especially when we don't feel like it really is that relevant to us. And we just don't feel like it's what we need. We have engineers. That we have in our minds what it is we really would like to hear. And so we'll gravitate towards those teachers who will give us what we want to hear. That's especially true when we're under pressure. In fact, the matter is, a lot of us are under pressure a lot of the time. For the Hebrews, the pressure was from fellow Jews. For the church today in our society, it is the constant pressure, whether brazen or subtle, that comes from a world that's trying to force us into its mold. The Apostle Paul admonished the Romans. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, in light of his mercies, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. In other words, don't let the world force you into its mold, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're not supposed to be pushed into this world's mold, but that's where the pressure is coming from. Just shoving us into the world, like being like the world. The world system, frankly, the, the, the God doesn't matter philosophy at best, and the God is, you know, the anti-God <laughs> and it's worse. Seems that the, the, it's a tendency, certainly for Christians today, to only have a desire to have their felt needs met. Anything else that doesn't do that is considered irrelevant. And it goes unrecognized that sound doctrine is the strong and lasting foundation upon which a truly spiritual life can be built. Furthermore, it is not content that people crave, but creatively crafted delivery that has become the measure of a good message. 
not suggesting we should be dry as dust when we preach the Word of God. We should try to make it interesting and we should try to, to make it applicable for our lives today. But the fact is, it is applicable for our lives today, whether we feel like it is or not. And that's the point here. That's why we have to endure this teaching, because it isn't necessarily like eating candy. Sometimes it's like eating your vegetables. And which is better for you, by the way? <laughs> so sometimes it is the crafty delivered, craftily delivered message. Throw in some dim lights and some mood setting music and you've really created a moving experience. How could, how could that be anything but the highest form of worship? The sound doctrine? No, not so much. That's why Paul gave Timothy the above challenge. Preach in season. That means when it's, when it's well received, preach out of season. When it's not well received. There's times when you're going to feel like Jeremiah, the prophet who was told before he ever went out to preach that they're not going to listen to you. How would you like to go out on a mission like that? Go out and preach the word and nobody's going to listen to you. There's times like that. It's not in season. It's not like they're going to receive it well, but you'll have to preach anyway. You're going to have to convince. You're going to have to rebuke. And it's going to require a great deal of long-suffering and patience. Just a few verses earlier, here in 2 Timothy, Paul wrote those words that we spoke at the beginning of this service before we started singing songs. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable. It's relevant. <laughs> for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So the writer of Hebrews, whether it was Paul, we don't know who it was, it could have been Paul. But if it wasn't Paul, he's writing in concert with Paul, appealing to his readers to bear with the word of exhortation. There's something else he wants them to do here. And that is in verse 24. Greet all those who rule, greet all those who rule over you or who lead you and all the saints. Those from Italy greet you. Okay, so this might seem a little insignificant and I know it's not perhaps the most profound thing he wrote in the letter. But these things matter. There's people out there that I want you to greet. I want you to, I want you to let them know that I care. That I love them. You know, this letter is for a group of, of believers, Jewish believers in fact, and it could be that the writer as new, new believers were coming to faith in Christ throughout time, there may have been some people that were part of these churches that he still hadn't had the chance to meet, but he wanted to, to still express love for them, greet them. Now, he specifically brought out these, those who have leadership over them, spiritual leaders. And that's significant. No doubt those people were cohorts. They were, they were like Colleagues uh, in, the, in, in, in the missional endeavor. Um, other apostles or close associates with apostles that he wanted them to greet. But not just them, all the saints. Even perhaps the ones I've not met yet. And then, of course, he also wanted them, he wanted to pass along greetings from those of Italy. We don't know if that means, we don't know exactly where he was writing from and exactly who he was writing to or where they were located. Some, some, some suggest he was writing to people in Italy and therefore um, those who were from Italy with him away from home, he was were sending greetings back. Others suggest that he was writing from Italy and so those who were with him from Italy were, no, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. But the point is, the greeting is important. The expressions of love and care and concern were important. And so he wants them to do that as well. Some things he wanted them to do. There's also some things he wanted them to know. Look at verse 23. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Now again, I recognize that this doesn't seem like it's the real meat of the doctrinal teaching that he was giving them, and it's not. But I don't want to 
probably just skip over it either. Interestingly, the word, the word here, set free, the, the word that is translated set free here, can also mean sent away. Acts chapter 13, let me read a few verses for you here from Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. And I will show you an instance in which it just means sent away. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. That's the exact same word that here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 23 is translated set free. Sent away, set free. So there are those who argue on the basis partially of this verse, but also on the basis that there's no record in Scripture of Timothy ever being in prison. <clears throat> they suggest this really should be set, sent away, like he was just sent out on a mission. And then when he returns... The writer of Hebrews and Timothy together then would come to see them. That's a possibility. But I, I really believe that it really probably does mean set free. That he probably was in prison, even though we don't have a record of that in Scripture. We know that Timothy was a close associate of the Apostle Paul, who was imprisoned on more than one occasion. And it's kind of likely that he would have belonged with Paul from time to time been in prison. <laughs> And somehow it seems like a little bit more to write home about. You know what I mean? Not that it's insignificant that Timothy might have been sent away. But if he was released from prison, now that's news. That's news, exciting news, probably answers to prayer. Maybe even on the part of the recipients of this letter. And so that was good news. I mean, that was good news to hear. And of course, there's the promise then that they would come to see them. Timothy and the writer here would come to see them as soon as they had opportunity. Verse 25 reveals a second thing the writer wants them to know. It's a familiar phrase. More often than not, at the beginning of some of the New Testament books of the Bible, but he simply says, grace be with you all. Amen. Not only did we talk, uh, sing songs this morning about um, the Word of God, about how firm a foundation we have in his excellent word that God has revealed himself to us through the written word. And that's valuable. We also sang about the wonderful grace of Jesus because of this phrase right here in this passage. Grace be with you all. Amen. Let me just rehearse for you several of the places in scripture in which this greeting is written. Romans chapter 1, and every one of these is at the beginning of the book. At the beginning of the book of Romans, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 2, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 1 verse 3, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And Philemon chapter 1 verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's no wonder they're all written by the same person. These books were all written by the Apostle Paul. Grace is so incredibly important for the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. What can be more meaningful than grace. Because, first of all, it is by grace that we're saved. Grace is, a, is you, you probably recognize grace as being that which we received that we didn't deserve. It's a gift. It, it's, it's related to mercy, but it's kind of the flip side of the coin. Mercy is whenever we don't get what we deserve. Um, we've been recipients as believers of both. We deserve as sinners everlasting torments in the lake of fire. 
But instead of getting what we deserve, we get what we don't deserve, which is an eternal home in heaven by God's grace. All because of the person of Jesus Christ, who paid our death penalty for us. So what could be more precious to us? We're saved by grace. But not only are we saved by grace, it is only by grace, the grace of God, that we can continue to live the Christian life. We are ever dependent on His grace. Just because we're saved doesn't mean that we now do things in our own power. No, it's just Christ in us and Christ through us. So as it pertains to our salvation, grace, well, not just our salvation, but our salvation and then our life together as believers. Some have used the acrostic grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. All the riches we have in Christ Jesus, read about it in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. All the riches we have in Christ Jesus, they're ours. It's His grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. It cost Jesus His life. It cost Him a lot. But grace is free to us. Some have defined grace as the supply of every need. That's not a bad definition. All these definitions tend to be a bit incomplete, but they are, they are nonetheless correct. The supply of every need. My God shall supply all your needs according to his mercy. Christ Jesus will supply all our needs. Everything we need, spiritually speaking, certainly beyond spiritually speaking, but it's all by God's grace. It's the supply of every need. And certainly it pertains to the Christian life, as we've already said, and you've heard the acrostic I like to use, God's resource for acquiring Christ's excellencies. We've been studying the essential virtues on Sunday nights. And the first virtue, add to your faith virtue, is actually the Greek word arete, and it means, it means excellencies or excellence. And, and it speaks of our purpose, <coughs> our purpose as believers to show forth the excellencies of our Savior Jesus Christ. It's by grace that we can do that. That's the only way. God's resource for acquiring Christ's excellence is we can become and be becoming like Christ because of His grace. And therefore fulfill our purpose so that a watching the world around us will see our lives and see Christ in us. A powerful testimony of who Christ is. I trust that we can be the best testimony possible. We're not perfect. We're perfect. We're still fallible human beings who will fail all too many times. By God's grace, we want to be as much like Christ as we can be. And we'll certainly be moving more and more like Christ all the time. You know, some today in the church tend to look at grace as God's freeing us to live however we please. When in reality, grace is God empowering us to live as he pleases. Any mature believer knows the value and the indispensability of God's grace. So the writer of Hebrews knew it and he, he, he desires it for these people. You need to know the grace of God. You need to experience the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Not just academically, experientially. So these closing comments are an expression of, of love of fellowship in prayer and, and the desire to be face to face with one another, of greetings back and forth to one another, just a loving concern and care for one another, a, a recognition of the, of the value of sound doctrine and, 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 and heeding and enduring the difficult things that the writer had written to them. And of course, that extends to us as well that we need to be a people that, in, that, that desire to know God and to. To, to desire to be taught of God. And then, of course, the need for grace for all of us in the body of Christ. So let's, let's show those same kinds of, of concern, that, that same kind of love for one another. Concern for one another's spiritual well-being in the family of God. 
So here's the conclusion. The writer of Hebrews closes his book in a summary of what was most important to them to know and do. See all the teachings I've given you. Pray for one another, greet one another, and desire grace for one another. And we too need to discover God's priorities for our lives. And they're much the same in a different set of circumstances, but still the same needs that we have today. Let's make our priorities God's priorities. Father, thank you so much for the study we've had in the book of Hebrews. Though their situation is, in some respects, vastly different than ours, at its core, when you think about how human nature has been the same since the fall to our day now, the same heart struggles are still there. Though our circumstances may be different, and our hearts were the same, just have the same needs, the same tendencies, the same passions, and the same need for the grace of God for sound doctrine in our lives to give us direction. It's the stable foundation to live on and according to. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ for the salvation that is in Him. Some of these Hebrew people had a tendency to be seeking in their own power to adhere to the law and by their works become righteous. And that was never your intent. In fact, the law was to demonstrate to us that we are unable to keep it and that we're desperately in need of the Lord Jesus Christ and His deliverance for us from sin and its power, its penalty, and one day from His presence as we spend eternity in you. Father, again, while the Hebrew people may have been trusting a little bit something different than us at the heart, we still have our own way that we try to go. We have a tendency to want to be autonomous and governed by no one but you, but, but us, and ourselves. And the Lord, we know that we need, we need you, a loving, benevolent creator, God over us, who's established laws that that govern our lives, Lord, who, 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 who's devised a way of salvation in the person of Jesus to bring us back into fellowship with you. Lord, we are recognize our utter dependence on you and, and, and on your grace. So thank you for the study. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for the person of Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen.